Hello. Um, I've had a request from a loyal viewer uh, to talk about Saving Private Ryan. Obviously a great film by Spielberg. Uh, fairly old film now. Um, great film. I mean, uh, probably my favourite Spielberg film is uh, Schindler's List, uh, which maybe I'll talk about another time. The only problem with Saving Private Ryan uh, is that it's been years since I watched it. However, I have played the beach scene recently to my daughter because I'm trying to teach her about history. She, you need a sense of history as you grow up to, you know, so you can put your place, um, our place sort of into uh, the scheme of history um, because, you know, there's far too many people that are totally ignorant about these things that happened. And so I've seen the beach scene and frankly, there's enough to talk about with the scene on Omaha Beach to, you know, do a video. And it's still, you know, I, I want it to be a quick video, but it probably won't be because um, there's so much to say just about that. Now, so yeah, we're just going to review the beach scene. Um, so where do we start with this? Um, it's a brilliant portrayal of what it was like for those troops going in in the first wave. So the first wave um, was 12 boats uh, with elements. I, I, I'm trying to think how many they fit on each of those Higgins boats. Oh, it was quite a few maybe 30 odd troops per boat uh those flat bottom boats they're just really kind of plywood to be honest uh, or very thin metal uh so just a machine gun bullet will rip through that let alone an artillery shell um so you've got no protection there it was the u.s big red one so the u.s first infantry division who were battle hardened they'd seen a lot of combat so they knew what they were doing and also the u.s 29th division elements of that who were going in on Omaha Beach. And they had another 12 of these flat-bottomed assault boats released from 12 miles out. Um, that was a long way out, um, especially in that choppy weather, because as we know, D-Day had been meant to have been uh, a couple of days before and they'd had to do like a 24-hour delay and you know all this stuff. They needed it to coincide with a full moon and also so that they could, um, with the parachute uh, assault troops, the 101st, the 101st Airborne, and also the British paratroops, um, they needed a full moon, so they had any chance of being roughly dropped in the full, in the correct uh, landing grounds to take their objectives. And also, um, they had to coincide with a, coincide, I mean, with a low tide, so that all the beaches, uh, with their landing obstacles on them, were exposed. You couldn't go in there with a high tide. Um, this is the first thing, one of the things that's incorrect, by the way, I might as well say it now in case I forget to say it later. Uh, what you'll notice about the beach is it has these obstacles which look like telegraph poles and they're kind of concreted into the sand and they're propped up on sort of X-shaped um, wooden beams to be like 45 degree angles. It's like these big long poles spiking up and they're facing the wrong way on uh, the film. They're facing, as you might think, uh, out to sea to skewer um, uh, landing craft. Uh, however, that's incorrect. Uh, if you look at actual pictures of Omaha Beach and if you listen to the veterans, they actually return the other way. The idea being that the landing craft would sort of run up them um, and it would either flip them over, throwing all the troops out, and um, they also were attached to artillery shells uh, that were ready so that uh, an impact with the boat would explode them. So, um, or some other kind of, death, you know, mine or whatever. Um, so they, they would blow up. Uh, we also have the Rommel Spargel. Um, Rommel's asparagus. I mean, I don't know if that's what they called it. I haven't heard a veteran say that, but that's what we used to call them, Rommel Spargel. And incidentally, German asparagus can get in little and it's white rather than green. Uh, and it's, seems nicer than our asparagus, especially with a cheesy sauce. But I mean, that's a digression. But um, if you want to shelter behind beach obstacles, uh, I'd advise getting behind the Rommel Spargel because it looks like it's made of like bits of railway track or something, um, you know, a decent bit of metal. And it may not be mined if you're lucky, although it was pretty mined the beach. Whereas those wooden things, if you see a machine gun bullet against wood, nah, go straight through it. Wood is about the worth, worst material in the world for stopping a bullet. Uh, the other thing about the beach, which we ought to say, is <clears throat> if you look at Omaha Beach from the bluffs in the middle, 
up the, the sand dunes, whatever you want to call them. Omaha Beach is very, very, uh, what's the word? It just, just, it's a long way out. It's a long, long beach going outwards, not just really long going, you know, from left to right, but out to sea. It's something like 300 metres. And I think that distance was somewhat compressed in the film. It doesn't look like it's 300 metres. This is a long way, you know, at low tide, to make your way under this hellacious fire, you know, was... Uh, it's just awful. Um, so, yeah, so the beach, yeah, perhaps the size isn't right. Um, certainly those telegraphy pole things, um, they were... Uh, yeah, pointed the wrong way in the film. But that, that's a minor thing. The main thing you get is that trepidation. I imagine that um, you've uh, been over there um, going on various transport ships that have been you quickly have the channel swept um, so you can exit from the south of the UK round there into Normandy. That's been swept uh, sort of the night before. Um, and you have your mind-swept channels that you're coming along. That's all right. But when you get, although it may not be all right if you're... <laughs> You know, some people get really seasick. I was once on a catamaran from um, Malta over to Sicily, and I was thrown up the whole way until I couldn't throw up anymore. It was absolutely awful, and that was like a modern catamaran. Um, so I imagine a lot of them were feeling rough from that. But then you've got 12 miles to go in this flimsy little Higgins boat or whatever assault craft you're in, that must have been pretty damn awful. And they were packed in like sardines, these things. I think they had over 30 troops put on these little, little boats. And you can imagine the vomit and everything. You know, you can't get to the side to throw up over the side. You are literally thrown up in your helmets and, you know, doing your best to get your mate to throw it overboard or whatever. So you're going in already degraded. Or I don't mean like humiliated because I don't think soldiers cared about that but you're going in physically degraded, that you're feeling rough and you're probably dehydrated and your assaults will be lower and all this kind of thing. Um, so the film really captured that, all that trepidation. And don't forget, if you want the Big Red One, they had done this before. I think they assaulted at Anzio um, in, uh, in Italy. And I think they, or it, maybe it was Salerno at Sicily, but they had certainly been in already and they knew about uh, these beach landings. So, you know, they know what to expect and it's not particularly good. Uh, and, but if you're in the 29th um, Infantry Division, then they're mostly green soldiers. They've not, they've practiced, but hey, the practice didn't go too well, did it? You know, Operation, was it Operation Tiger we called it? The one that slaps and sounds. You go there, there's um, a, um, sort of round line Regis this is down uh, his Dorset I think uh, and they got a Sherman tank that was found under the sea that was recovered and restored and put there as a monument because uh, several hundred GIs lost their lives during that practice attack basically really if I'm honest it was because the Royal Navy for whatever reason didn't do its job whether it was miscommunication or not but either way those practice um, the the whole point of that practice that slaps and sounds which happened just a couple of weeks before I think um that was just to get the troops used to going in, landing on the beach under fire. So what the Royal Navy was doing, bombardment of the beaches, uh, they also wanted to know, you know how would our various um, things, you know, uh, floating tanks, uh, DD Shermans and ducks, you know, which are those kind of amphibious vehicles that occasionally drown people in the US because they still use them, don't they, in the south of different lakes and places. And, I wanted to see how they perform. You got bombarded beach with shell holes everywhere, and so they they got the Royal Navy to actually bombard the beach uh, while the troops were going in, and even that there was a miscommunication. So some American tr soldiers were killed by Royal Navy gunfire, if you can believe it, and then they're told actually we need another go, so stay in the ships overnight. The Royal Navy it seems are withdrawn some distance, if not returned home, and they're at the mercy of what we call e-boats, enemy boats, uh, which are motor torpedo boats, uh, schnell button, um, S-boats, uh, Germans would call them. Um, and that, I didn't quite realise this until I thought about it recently. Had they not found and identified, um, it's something like 30 officers who were what we call bigots, which was, I don't know what the acronym for bigot was, 
but it was soldiers who knew, or officers that knew rather, that um, the target was Normandy, and they, you know, that that was the real D Day, and they they had date in their minds and this kind of stuff. They were worried that the E boats might have taken some prisoners, and of course, you're not going to last long out under interrogation by the Gestapo or the SS or something, are you? And so, if they hadn't found all the bodies of those that were bigots that had the knowledge, um, that might have caused the delay of D-Day um, or a complete rethinking. It's quite, you know, that it, so it caused more problems than just the immediate loss of ships and life. And unfortunately, the reality was there was a surplus of GIs, but there wasn't a surplus of um, LSTs, landing ship tanks, and their different variants. And so um, I forget if it was like two or three they lost, but that was serious. That was quite serious. Um, anyway, that was a digression. Sorry. Going back to um, the beach scene. So this is true. That basically what they had, the defence for Omaha Beach, I forget quite how long it is, but I think it's like three miles or so. It's a very long beach. As I say, very deep beach going out to sea, uh, covered with obstacles. And it has five draws coming off it, which are roads that come back through uh, those bluffs um, and then get you to a lateral road that links one end to the other, so the west to the east. And as you can imagine, those roads are heavily fortified because obviously those are the places where it's easier to theoretically get off the beach and get behind. Either end, though, you have very high cliff faces uh, the shoulders sort of go up into these massive cliffs, both ends, and on the westerly end, actually that's the problem with, I, sh I should say the west end, because westerly is what you use for breezes that come from the west, as opposed to being the west, I think that makes sense. Um, yeah, so a westerly wind going to the east, there you go, yeah, whatever. At the west you have something called Point de Hoc, um, and this was different. This was where uh, US rangers were um, tasked to go in, scale those cliffs using grappling hooks and using uh, very high ladders that they borrowed from the London Fire Service, apparently. Uh, they would have to get up and take charge of the guns. They, didn't, they, they knew there were guns there. At least there had been very recently. Um, <clears throat> and what happened at both the ends of the beach, they had fortified... They had little um, kind of pillbox things they called Tobruks. I don't know if that's a reference to Tobruk in um, Libya from the desert campaign and Rommel named them that, or whether that's a German thing that I, I have no knowledge of. But either way, a Tobruk is kind of a little reinforced pillbox with a firing slit. Um, and they also had some completed and some not yet completed um, beach defences uh, which were bunkers with really thick reinforced concrete uh, built by the Toto organization um, that were, you know, these could withstand direct hits from rockets, from typhoons and things like that, and even small naval gunfire. I'm sure that, you know, a 15 or 14 inch or 13 inch shell direct hitting one of them would destroy it. But they were pretty, pretty strong. And this is one of the reasons why, although before all this went down at H hour, which was either 7 or 7.30 in the morning, so I don't know if off the top of my head, but it, it was early at first light. They'd already been bombarded um, for, I think, about half an hour was the bombardment. But this was the problem, that, um, that these defences were fortified. And also, because of the combination of the mist and the smoke as well, where all of the um, sand dunes were catching fire, the naval gunfire is relying on being able to see their targets, and then they spot spot the flash and they use their ranging devices that sort of make a triangle when you focus them through your eyes. Um, and you can range accurately the distance and you can hit your targets fairly accurately, but it requires visual sight. You can't use your radar to do that. So um, they were struggling with their ranging. So a lot of the gunfire was inaccurate. As for hitting a, a single Tobruk or a single beach redoubt, not possible really. You know, you're relying on peppering it with shot. And, uh, you know, if you're firing only for half an hour, you're not doing that. Incidentally, they'd already had bombing raids going in over there. We knew that they shared out the bombing across 
all likely invasion places across the whole of France, because if you just bomb Normandy, it's pretty obvious that's where you're going to attack. So only about a quarter of the bombs that were dropped in the prelude to Overlord, which was obviously the name of that invasion, um, only about a quarter of them were dropped in Normandy. But um, <clears throat> the, this on the morning, though, they obviously all pretend ceases at this point, and the idea was that I think it was the liberators they were using were going to um, come along and drop a ton of bombs, or several tons actually, uh, right over those coastal defences and beach defences. The problem was they, the, the commander in charge of the air uh, bombing operation basically said, you know, we're not accurate enough. We can't do it. We're going to need to because they were worried about the timing of everything as the troops were coming in to land, you know, for five minutes early, you know, where we hit our own troops. And they allowed too big a margin of error. They they said, well, we can only drop, you know, um, if we do it this far away from the, the sea, just to make sure we don't hit our own troops. And all the, all the bombs dropped well behind it inland from the beach, because uh, and the reality was, if they'd just, you know, come sideways across it, which, oh, there's a big debate on whether he even goes straight through the fences, or, and it was, all oh, uh, it was, I, I've forgotten the technicalities of the debate, but there's this massive debate on do you come head on the beach defences, or do you turn and then go sideways along them? And it was all about getting their planes in and out in time. It seemed that the way you arrange a squadron, um, it didn't, seem to work out if they actually went sideways along them, which I guess makes sense because it's so wide you're bombing the sea with some of them and you're, um, you know, you, you've got to get all your planes passed in that discrete parcel of time. Uh, so they went in straight instead. I think that was the conclusion they came to. I can't actually remember. It's a long time to listen to that. But either way, it all combined to the bombing being totally ineffective at the last minute. So the beach, um, the, the beach defences were intact. Uh, those six um, draws, was it five? I can't remember now. Five or six uh, main roads coming off this very wide beach. Luckily, the defences there in the middle had not yet fully been completed because I believe Rommel had only come to inspect them uh, ooh, maybe six weeks before or something like that. So, And Rommel, when he looked at it, it reminded him, apparently, is what it said, of Salerno. And he said, like, if they're coming to Normandy they'll attack here because he could just see it looks perfect for what they're after. Um, and so he made sure that a somewhat veteran division was protecting that beach as opposed to the other uh, four beaches. In total, there were five invasion beaches in, in, on D-Day. Um, and uh, it, he ensured it was the uh, 352nd German um, infantry division which was somewhat mobile. Some of, most all the other divisions, I think, were that were actually out in front were known as static divisions. Namely, they were using old wounded soldiers, pensioned off soldiers, uh, foreigners, you know, that had been press gang were otherwise blackmailed into service, or maybe even wanted to serve for money. But they were second rate soldiers. Uh, whereas the three five second, it had a, a solid cadre of of soldiers from the Russian front who knew their stuff. And they hadn't had very long to train the rest of the men. The rest of the men were not veterans of the Eastern Front. But this solid component had really instilled into its men uh, discipline. So they were a tough, a tough opposition. Now, I was talking about the cliffs at either side. And what they had there, they had um, 88s, which uh, obviously the anti-aircraft stroke anti-tank gun. And they had... Uh, um, uh, uh, what's the word? I've registered them. <laughs> That's the word I was looking for. They'd registered them so they could hit targets on a sixpence all over that beach. They regularly, according to a veteran I was listening to, practised at doing this. So they had that aim all the way down the beach from both sides and they could hit a boat coming in accurately with those 88s. They also had 75s. I don't know if those were German or maybe even Great War French 75s, which were an excellent field gun. Um... But either way, they had some 75s. And they also had MG42s, which is famous because it's um, obviously a mid-war development designed in 42. 
And it has little rollers where the cartridges, shells, go into um, the chamber where they're, where they're fired. And rather than sort of our ones that are just shoved up into there by the blowback action um, and so on, and they're subject to friction, which obviously slows the gun down a tad, um, with these, cause it was only really this simple little innovation. It had little rollers, I think were on springs, and it just took away the friction. So all the cartridges on the belt could roll up um, into the chamber and it could fire at twice the rate of our machine guns. So it was about 1,500 rounds per minute. So you could only fire this in short bursts, though. If you held your finger down, very quickly all those exploding cartridges would cause the gun to overheat, that is to say the muzzle, or the barrel, I should say. Um, and yet you would be equipped with a few spare barrels. Uh, what you had when you got your MG42, you got an asbestos pad as part of the kit, and you did get some spare barrels, and it didn't take long to change them under pressure. I think you could probably do it in a couple of minutes if you knew what you are doing, but if you got it wrong, you know, you're going to have more than a little blister on your finger. Um, and as for the asbestos pad, uh, mesothelioma wasn't on their minds on that day. So, excuse me, I've got hiccups. So the, these are devastating guns. They were known as Hitler's burp gun. Because, <laughs> an appropriate time, a hiccup. Because you couldn't hear, like with our Bren gun, the staccato clatter of the gun. You would just hear, brr, brr, brr. Yeah, because it was so rapid firing. Um, were there plans for the beach? Because when they land, it looks like they're in a bit of a panic in the film, doesn't it? And they're all trying to get up the beach... And they seem to be improvising a lot. Was that correct? Well, out of the documents we've had, it does seem there were not really any good plans. Now, this is inexcusable, really, because we had excellent photo reconnaissance of the beaches and of all of the uh, defences and all this stuff. So you think different teams of men would be assigned to attack different parts, different defences. They'd have specialist weapons to attack them, as we did at our beaches gold, obviously due to Canadian sword. Um, and obviously the Americans have Utah and Omaha. So just go through them actually from left to right if we're stood in France. Uh, Utah, Omaha, gold, Juno, sword. Yeah, five D-Day beaches. And we had all sorts of weird preparations of how we're gonna deal with different things. Like we'd even built a tank, it was a Sherman, but it had a mortar called a petard on the front of it. And um, the sort of dude sat at the front next to the driver had a, a way of sticking out his hand, um, exposing it for a moment to fire, but he would shove this massive, I don't know how many inches it was, but it was a whopping great thing, like 20 inches or something, stick this thing in the mortar tube. Um, it had a very short barrel with a massive caliber. Um, and it was specifically designed for blowing up concrete beach emplacements and listening again to some veterans when they saw this thing coming it was like hell on earth you know the way it rained down uh, and just smashed things to bits and as well when we were landing our Churchill crocodiles which you know can uh, go up bluffs and go up hills you know the most um, the best traveling infantry tank of the war in the sense it would go up anything pretty much very, very lucky on the Dieppe raid a couple of years earlier where the beach wasn't properly surveyed and it was one of the few things a crocodile don't, can't get across. <laughs> they got marooned on the beach. But these things, you know, they were using Churchill um, crocodiles, which are the ones with the massive flame flowers, throwers on them. So you could imagine, that, you know, these coming towards your pillbox and everyone being uh, burnt to death and how that just f put everyone to flight. The Americans weren't... <sighs> I don't believe their planning for actually taking the beach was as detailed as it should have been. At least what has so far come about in the records, the archives that we have seen, is basically like we land, rush up the beach, get in behind, someone mops up the beach defences, we carry on pressing on, uh, then get then dig in ready for a counterattack. It really seemed to be like that cursory, um, not realising the sheer defences this beach would have. So, 
Um, so that's what it had. So from either end, you had the machine guns and the, the field guns, the 88s and whatnot. Then in the centre, you had partially completed defences, uh, but still hard to take. Um, and that is shown the first wave suffering over 50% casualties. Um, those boats, as I said, won't stop machine gun bullets. So as for waiting for the hatch to you know, to go down before you're struck by a burst of machine gun fire, that's probably inaccurate. I think they just go straight through uh, that anyway. Don't believe they even had armour at the front. Uh, like, could possibly be wrong. My understanding is no. Um, although they did have a variety of different boats, so it might have depended a little on that. Um, the other thing is, when they're in the water, there were some clips of bullets zipping past under the water. Now, if you know anything about forensics, you know the way you test a bullet to do ballistics comparisons is by firing into a water bath. And within a couple of feet, the bullet stopped, at least with a handgun. Um, and so those people, those soldiers in the water, I'm sure there was a scene where you see these bullets zipping right through the water. That's not realistic. It slows it down extremely fast. And this is something that actually saved the lives of a lot of soldiers on the day. Those that had their boats blown up are in the water. They're being fired on, and the bullets may well have hit them, but they had actually been slowed down enough by the water that they weren't penetrating. Um, how did they actually take the beach? You might as well cut to the chase. So after a couple of waves, it's just a nightmare, really. They're being absolutely slaughtered. I would say decimated, but that's one in ten, and this was far worse than one in ten. Um, and both divisions, the Green Division and the Big Red One, uh, both getting slaughtered and you don't get any protection like I said behind the wooden obstacles that are mined or behind the Rommelspiegel or whatever and they're trying to get up to the bluffs where they've got there's a bit of a seawall and they were hoping that the tanks could simply blast all this stuff out of the way but of course they had a lot of floating tanks that had, that had sunk and those tanks luckily the crews stayed on top because this was dumb as well they they must have known in that swell, released them as far out as they did, that they had no chance of making the land. They had to change the plan of getting closer, given the weather on that day. And it, yeah, um, all but one, I believe, sunk. And usually the crew would stay on top while it was swimming in. These are the, the Shermans with a big tank canvas uh, thing around the tank to make it buoyant um, and then these sort of propellers that were somehow attached into the, the crankshaft or whatever to get it to move. A remarkable thing actually when you listen to the veterans they just couldn't believe it that there's tanks swimming at them. But that's another story. Uh, I've got to make this video brief. Damn it's going faster than I thought at the time. Um, all but one of those sank and the crews on the outside for the most part lived but per tank you know the driver would usually drown because he had to be inside. Um, and usually maybe one or, one, or, one other did as well. So it was a, a tremendous loss of life. However, they did eventually get tanks onto the beach using landing ship tanks, LSTs. Um, but again, with 88 millimeters against Shermans, this was a struggle. So how did they really take the beach? Well, this all kicked off at about 7.30. The battle rage with this terrible slaughter for a good hour or so. And then it seems there's almost a lull in the fighting. While they, if both sides were looking to regroup, obviously the Germans were looking to try and get ammo. Because they're just running out of ammo. Um, and they were sending people back to bring ammo. But they're getting shot up by the tactical air force overhead by Mustangs. And diving down on them and thunderbolts and stuff. And... This was really what won the day. It was air power, I might as well say it now, that they weren't able to get ammunition, actually, to the beach defences. Um, heard a funny account from one veteran who uh, said he, you know, that most of his you know, people there have been shot because someone had got onto his bunker and grenaded it and that. Um, he ran out to get more ammo for the machine gun and the off his officer pulled a pistol on him and said, hey, if you're fleeing, I'll shoot you kind of thing. He's like, no, I'm just getting ammo. And he's like, get back inside. We'll get the medic to bring the ammo. So he didn't really trust their soldiers. Um, and some of them had the most terrible shell shock, like just blubbering like little kids with their hands over their heads, you know, sort of 
bouncing around on all fours or the, um you know not on fours or around so there's but you know squatting down crouching corners um crying for their mothers under the bombardment um that was the thing it really affected them, the naval bombardment, even though it didn't actually hurt them, really, in these strong bunkers. Just that all these ginormous explosions sound like an intercity train coming down like right over your head, you know. Um, but this was the thing. They were running out of ammo and their barrels were overheating. We never saw this in the film, I don't believe, changing an MG42 barrel. But that's the reality. You, the, the way they were firing the guns that day, thousands upon thousands of rounds, uh, they would have soon got through their their barrels as well, and that was a problem. Um, how did it get taken? We had this little low on the fighting, and the problem now was that the plan was being rolled out, and it was assumed that they need all their other equipment, uh, you know, that they need for going further inland. Um, and the people out to sea didn't really know what was going on. It doesn't seem the radios were working particularly well. Um, and they were starting to send in ships that had kind of ancillary equipment, that's all very nice and very useful. Uh, little half tracks and um, I don't know, whatever, whatever else, maybe bridging equipment, um, maybe artillery pieces and stuff. But it's all getting chewed up on the beach and it's not what they need. And so um, the command, the highest ranked officer on the beach, whose name I can't remember, actually radios back to, um, oh, damn, I forget everything now. Was it General Bradley? Um, I think it was Omar Bradley, but anyway, the American commander, um, and says, look, we need more infantry. We haven't taken the beach. We need infantry, not all this crap. And then he has a decision to make, Bradley, because he's thinking, um, do I, if it's going this badly, I haven't taken the beach yet, we've lost all these men, shall I just ask Eisenhower if we can um, land the rest of our stuff at... Um, gold the british beach because they knew that had been taken and of course had they done that i mean apart from the reaction of montgomery you could imagine what he'd have been like you know he hate yeah not hated the americans but he he did use you yeah, know he had a a big rivalry with them let's say and he was a very um a, <laughs> like coffee cocky self-confident man um but anyway, he was told immediately, no, nope, the British are landing all their own stuff. You can't, um, you can't nick their beach. You've got to take your own beach. And so he says, yeah, we'll go ahead. And they start landing a, you know, a load more infantry. And this is the point now. So a couple of hours, um, you, uh, 8, 10.30, maybe 10.30, 11, something like this, starting to land a ton more infantry. Um and this is when finally they're getting this toehold. Um, I think they may even have had one tank that was able to blast a bit of a seawall. Uh, or possibly it was with um, demolition charges. But they, they finally got through this the seawall and they're starting to make some little penetrations up into the sand dunes. And this is one thing that's very, very good in the film, actually, that um, a couple of soldiers come out of one of these uh, strong points and they're saying something in a foreign language it isn't English and it isn't German and the Americans who are filled with bloodlust and rage having seen all their men killed they shoot these two guys and they're like what the hell is he saying and it was just a little observation that um, Spielberg knew his stuff because sorry I got hiccups again because they're actually speaking in Czech the Czech language, and they, they were saying, uh, we are not German. Uh, don't shoot, we are not German. The Americans shot them anyway. Um, but And they wouldn't have understood what the guys were saying. But I can't remember now if there are many mass surrenders. I don't think there were. I think most people in the film, I think most people were fighting to the last man. Although, again, it's so long since I watched it, I can't remember. One thing's for sure from listening to the veterans, they all believed that they could not surrender, that they would be killed if they surrendered. Um, heard that from several veterans. The reason being, they knew the slaughter they had wrought on that beach, and they knew that those Americans who've just seen their friends killed in front of them are not going to be merciful. And there was certainly, uh, there was certainly evidence of that. Just behind one of the beaches around this time, 
there was an ambulance with clearly marked red crosses and so on, a German ambulance that had patients on it. And apparently a couple of Mustangs came down. They flew over it, so they had time to observe it. They turned around and they both came back and strafed it, killed the driver. And I think two nurses actually were on it. So um, they, they killed the women. Uh, and I believe that the German, well, he's German, <laughs> and presumably was a Nazi. Um, he, I believe what that account, because he said, look, out of decency, you know, where they've been sort of blown up, and there are bits and everywhere, you know, we dug a hole and we actually buried them because they were ladies, we, you know, he wouldn't have bothered if it was men. Um, but similarly, also, you know, that was uh, a crime. You could say a war crime, couldn't you, really? But at the same time, I also have accounts for another veteran, this I think was behind Juno, where um, they cooked up, uh, cooked off a, a Sherman. A couple of the soldiers, somewhat burned, managed to get out. And then a couple of Hitler youths came up uh, and shot them both in the head. Um, and again, out of the paratroopers, uh, I forget which division it was, but I actually talked to one of the veterans from this division as well. He, we actually, the ones who had taken the Murrayville battery overnight, I actually talked to a veteran from them. They were uh, on a glider. He was, you know, paratrooper, but he came in via glider. But out of them, uh, three of them were seen. This this was seen by another of the German veterans. He reports it. He said, um, I was walking down the road inland and... I found three British uh, paratroopers kneeling down, leant forward, all been shot, execution style, in the back of the head. So this was undoubtedly going on. Um, so this thing with the Czech soldiers behind the beach there, uh, just to say as well, this shows now, basically the, when the Germans uh, initially started Operation Barbarossa, they just wanted to really kill all the um, Russian soldiers. They just herded them into barbed wire fields, uh, didn't really give him any food, any water. He just used to enjoy them all slowly dying. You know, and I, I, I wish I was exaggerating, but I'm not. It was just horrendous. Uh, and this is why almost all of those soldiers taken in the early days of Barbarossa, a couple of million were talking about, almost all of them died of starvation. Um, but after a while, when the Germans started to realise, hey, we have a bit of a manpower problem here, um, they gave them the option, hey, would you rather uh, die... Uh, of starvation or whatever, or would you like to become a loyal uh, Wehrmacht soldier? And, you know, it's a rock and a hard place, isn't it? So they were recruiting lots. Now, admittedly, if you're Czech, um, I don't entirely know, um, you know, that wasn't quite the same as Barbarossa, but I presume it was a similar thing, that uh, maybe they got caught up in the Czech army and rather than, you know, languishing in a prison camp, uh, they had the option, you know, do you want to fight for pay? Take an oath of allegiance to Hitler um, and, you know, you'll be treated well. And it seems that these foreign soldiers, many of them, were treated perfectly um, decently by the Germans in, in that they weren't second-class citizens or anything. A lot of them were quite integrated um, into their, their battalions uh, and so on. Um, and interestingly, the message they all had at least out of these are the German veterans I've listened to. They almost saw it as like the European Union. They didn't say we're defending Fortress Europe. They said we're defending United Europe. And they almost saw it as though we have a peaceful United Europe now. Everybody's happy. I mean, it's amazing the cognitive, dis the cognitive dissonance, um, the, the fact that they're sort of forgetting, well, yeah, we have invaded this country illegally and stuff. Uh, you know, a war of aggression. But, um, yeah, you know, we're all united and happy now and we're defending Europe from the aggressors. And this is the language they were they were using. Um, but anyway, um, another event that really turned out. So, yeah, they made these little um, incursions by about midday, pushing through, looping back, um, managing to get in behind these various um, redoubts and strongholds and so on. And, you know using grenades, using um, Thompson guns, things like this, you know, clearing them out. Uh, Point du Hoc is one of the most interesting because that's right over there on the left. And it was believed that they had large artillery pieces there, and they did, only up until about two weeks before. Whereupon, because of all the bombing and strafing by the Allies, 
they'd actually moved them quite far away, so they were no longer in this position to bombard the beaches. Um, but the Rangers, US Army Rangers, didn't know that. And so they got there, they got badly scattered by all the tides and the bad weather and stuff, but they managed to regroup around this, this big bare cliff face. Um, and they had grappling hooks that were kind of like powered by an explosive charge. You fire up this massive uh, hook, hooks into um, whatever it, it finds, and then you can scale the rope. Um, the problem was they got soaking wet in the boats and suddenly the rope was way heavier than it was designed for it. It got soaking wet. And so the grappling hooks didn't really work very well. Um, but with the combination of the ladders and these rather wet grappling hooks, they did somehow get up this cliff face under fire and get to Point de Hoc and took it. And perhaps that is the most remarkable feat you could say on the whole of D-Day, I, I might say. Along with taking the Murrayville Battery, which is also an incredible achievement. Um, cause, but Point de Hoc, you know, going up a cliff under fire. And I think you saw a little bit of this you, in the film. You see a grappling hook going up and sort of dragging it a bit of bramble and stuff, and then the, the guy falls down. And, of course, that did that did happen, that kind of thing. Um, and, yeah, they did get up there, and they did take it. And I remember years ago now seeing a video of a veteran where some a ranger veteran and his mates, where they were there at Omaha, and they were all looking at what they had done back on the 6th of June, 44. And he just looks incredulously at his mates. He says... Can, you know, God's name, can someone tell us how the hell we did that? <laughs> you know, it was remarkable. It was remarkable. Um, so, yeah, uh, that was um, my discussion of, of the beach scene. Oh, I thought, what's the other thing I had to say? Um, oh, that was it, yeah. They had um, sort of two groupings of rangers designed to um, assist with the landing. They had the one going for Point de Hoc, and they had another lot who uh, I don't think they're actually... Dis I think they were meant to take Point Hoc from the other side. But with um, with all of the currents and everything, they thought, actually, better that we just go and, you know, throw our weight in behind the beach attack. Because um, they, they were really sort of struggling with the choppy weather and the strong currents and the high winds. It was all just causing chaos, really, in the landing. And this this group of rangers... Rather than landing sort of right in the middle of the beach, where they were in the crossfire, the enfilading fire down the beach from both ends, they were a bit more sensible and they picked a part of the beach that they saw was not being enfiladed in that same way. Um, and so they were actually able to land uh, on the beach without too much trouble and actually get their equipment off, get off some mortars, um, get off... Um, so, well, whatever else they have with them, heavy machine guns, maybe, I don't know. Uh, but certainly mortars, which are vital because they're giving you artillery. Uh, maybe they had anti-tank guns as well. Um, but either way, they were able to unload with some additional equipment because they weren't just being chewed up when they came in and, the, you know, as soon they landed and so on. Um, and it was them as well disintegrating the seawall, um, punching holes through it with um, this sort of little artillery that they were using. That was also crucial around this time. So Omaha did hang on a bit of a knife edge. And of course, it was the place where the most uh, soldiers uh, lost their lives. But um, it was over. Oh, there's been debates about the casualties. Um, it seems that in the immediate aftermath, the Americans wanted to hush it up a little bit because no one wants to talk about a terrible. Even though it was a victory, ultimately, it was a very heavy. Um, you know, Pyrrhic victory in a sense, they lost so much. And it's thought that whereas they said initially we suffered 2,000 casualties, it's thought more now it's like 4,300 to take that beach. Now, I believe that's casualties, not dead. So, you know, you would have to maybe divide it by three to get those that were actually killed. But, you know, that was something like three times worse than, um, I think, Sword was the next worth, the British, the next worse, the British beach. Um, Juno took heavy casualties as well but they made the most progress they were well inland but anyway by early afternoon um, they had pressed on they were mopping up and certainly by nightfall it was you know decently secure and this is when they start you know really fortifying bulking it up and getting more heavy machinery over um, 
I guess this is a problem with all films and all history now. It's a very American-centric thing. Let's not forget on D-Day that there are something like 150,000 troops used, and around 50,000 of them, maybe 55,000, were American. Yeah? Um, you know, Britain played a very vital role, as did Canada. Uh, the French, too, played a, a brilliant role. They landed three troops on D-Day. Um, <laughs> uh, the resistance did do some useful work for a change in the background as well, disrupting communications and all that kind of stuff. Um, so, but of course, it's today everyone thinks of Omaha Beach. Um, Omaha's a good song by Counting Crows, by the way, if you know the band. So, uh, Is it a city in Nebraska that comes from? Hey, anyway, whatever. Uh, right, I'm going to sign off. This video has been way too long. If you got through to the end, well done.